the story. Good job. Teach you more than other roles. All right, we'll bounce around a little today so we get some exercise in the Word of God. But we're going to start over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 1 is where we read Paul the Apostle writing, Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. And again, imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. We could say this a different way. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, for somebody to say this and for it to carry weight, their reputation must precede them. If a young person was to get up, I don't know which category I fit into these days, because I'm technically middle-aged, halfway to 70. <laughs> But if a young person were to get up, perhaps if I saw a contemporary of mine or even somebody younger, and they were to say, imitate me, follow my example as I follow Christ, it may not carry that much weight with the audience because that much life hasn't been lived. We haven't seen this person endure very many trials in life. For the most part, every now and then you come across a young person who has been deeply troubled by the trials of life and has learned many deep things by a very early age. But for the most part, if a young person was to get up and say, All right, everybody, imitate me, live just like me, their age would cause us to have a problem. Because for someone to say something like this, their reputation, their experience, their life must Go before them and speak before they can ever utter such words. And so it is when somebody like the Apostle Paul, who had such a radical and incredible and sudden conversion experience, when someone like that meets the Lord, somebody that others would have thought would have never have become a Christian, somebody who was so anti-Christian, when somebody like that comes to the Lord, and more than that, gives their life in service to the Lord Jesus, the way Paul did. You can read through 2 Corinthians, he talks about some trials. You, you can read about his life in the book of Philippians, when he, he testifies concerning himself. When you read about this man, the amazing reputation that goes before him, before we read these words, is immense. Trials and tribulations that he has endured all for the name of Christ. People know the story of how he met that Philippian jailer. After he had been beaten and abused, yet he and his friend Silas sat there in the jail at midnight and sang praises unto the Lord. And that great earthquake that took place, and even the jailer looked to Paul. What must I do to be saved, he said, as he was about to kill himself, because he thought for sure everybody had escaped and his life would be held accountable by the Roman government. He looked to Paul. What must I do? Because Paul's reputation preceded him. And so, too, in the Corinthian church, yes, he had his naysayers. We have read about those. But for the most part, he was a person in the early church that when he spoke, when he wrote, people listened because his reputation preceded him, went before him. And so here when he says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. This is the man who would declare to the church, for me to live is Christ. That is my very essence of existence. My life has been swallowed up in his life. You cannot look at me apart from Christ because I identify myself by the name of Jesus. For me to live is Christ. What a statement. And the life backed up the statement. His life gave evidence 
that indeed for Paul the Apostle, Jesus Christ was his life. And for him to live indeed was Christ. And he could say, to die is gain, because I look forward to being with the one whom I now serve. See, Paul was one who, who desired to follow Christ to the utmost. To give his best to the Lord at any cost, and it did cost him dearly in his life. And so when he says, follow my example, that example has gone before him. It's an example heard far and wide. It's an example seen when he is in the presence of God's people, and it's an example heard when he is outside of the presence of God's people. How easy it is to have a good reputation in the pew, but yet to keep up that reputation when you're in the workplace, or in your home, or outside of the church. Paul was one whose life was so wrapped up in Christ, and was so well known for his testimony, that he could say, follow me and my example, as I follow Christ and his example. It carried great weight when he said it then, and it carries great weight as we read it now. The Lord is faithful to give us godly saints, to give us faithful stewards, even in our own generation, even in our own day, that we might look to them, that we might see an example of a godly life and learn how to better serve the Lord through His servants. We need examples, just as the church in Paul's day needed His example. Remember, he even wrote to, uh, I believe it's the Philippians, and he says, you know, I don't know which is better, you know, to be executed by the Romans that I might go to be with Jesus, or to live longer, to not be executed, that I might stay with you, and that you might benefit from my teaching. I mean, Paul was somebody who really had something to offer to the church. We need people like that, where they could say, look, I want to go to heaven, but wow, you need my example. You need my teaching. You need my life to be lived in your midst, that you might have an example to follow. We need godly examples to follow. We need them. We need them. You see, when life gets difficult, I need to be able to look at somebody who has faced trial and tribulation, who has endured difficultly and has endured it in a godly way and in a Christ-like fashion so that I have some way of holding on to my faith and saying, okay, that person did it, here's how they did it. And it also gives us the sense that it can be done. Look, this person did live for Christ through these difficult things, so it can be done. That means I can do it as well. I, I think of the martyrs as old, of old. How important it was for martyrs to be able to see people go before them. I can give my life for Christ, and so you can as well. And in our day, I can serve my Lord, and you can serve Him all your life as well. We need examples to follow. I praise the Lord for such an example in my grandmother, Wanda Lou Osborne. She is somebody who could say these words, and they would carry great weight. They do carry great weight. We can look at her example, and she could say to us, imitate me, follow my example, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. I'm after Christ. I am seeking Him. Like David, he was a man after God's heart. My grandmother, Wanda Lou, was a woman after the heart of God. She was ever pursuing his heart. And she could say, follow me in my pursuit. I'm going the right way. It's okay to follow me. We need the testimonies that endure. Because as we read in our psalm, it's better to put confidence in the Lord than to put it in man. Because man will fail you. And you can think, and I can think, of many godly examples who have fallen by the wayside. How wonderful it is to be able to look at a full life, like Paul the Apostle, who did face martyrdom for his Lord. My grandmother, who did enter through the gates of heaven with a great and abundant entry, because once she surrendered to the Lord, 
She kept that surrender. She kept herself consecrated until her dying day so that we can look back on her life and say we can follow the example that she set. We can follow her just as she followed her Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's go over to John chapter 9. Grandma's life verse was John chapter 9, verse 4. When she was in Bible college, she was encouraged to find and discover a verse that would represent her life. And she found it in John chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. This was spoken by none other than the Lord Jesus himself. He experienced life as life with purpose. He, he, he understood that there was a mission for him to accomplish. There was a service for him to perform. And that brings us to our first point. Grandma gave us an example of service. Service. We are to serve the Lord. And her life's verse declares it so perfectly and so succinctly. I must work. I must work. I must work. Christians in our day don't understand that we must be about our Father's business. That we must work. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 verse 10 that we have been created in Christ Jesus to accomplish good works that have been ordained for us that we might find them, discover them, and perform them. God created you and He made me with a deep, heavenly, and eternal purpose. We are called to discover that purpose in service to Christ. I must work the works of Him who sent me. And they aren't just any works. They are the works of the Father. We are to do the work of God. We are to be down here spreading the word that His Son died for the whole world, that He gave His Son to the world because He so loved the world that none should perish, but that all should have everlasting life. We are called to serve Him. And it is His work. It's not charitable deeds. You see, we, we haven't been called to just live a good life for goodness sake. We have been called to do godly works for God's heavenly purposes. These are things that are to endure through the ages. That woman who anointed the feet of Jesus, Mary. And Jesus, when He corrected those who scoffed her for her offering, for wasting that sweet perfume on Jesus' feet. He said, what she has done unto me will go down in history. And wherever the gospel goes, her story will go as well. Wherever the gospel goes through my grandmother's bloodline, her story will go as well. When you serve the Lord, you don't serve Him in a limited, temporal sense. Your works live on. They go on through those that you have touched for Christ. Paul's mission ended thousands of years ago. And yet here we are still being touched by his words. My grandmother, her life may have ended a few weeks ago here on this earth. And yet it continues here in my testimony about her. And all who knew of her and knew about her understand that her life carried weight. If we can imitate her and follow her example because she was one who followed the example of Christ. And she followed that example in service. In service. Grandma was one who believed that she must serve the Lord. That she must be about her father's business. That she must do all unto the glory of God. I must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. 
life doesn't go on forever. Now, I speak of the physical life. Jesus gave us this great oxymoronic statement when he says, if you live and believe in me, you shall never die. If you live and believe in me, though you may die, he backs up the statement, though your body may give out, yet you will live forever. Yes, the flesh gives way, but the spirit is eternal. But one day, the body gives out. Jesus knew he didn't have forever on this earth. He came to do certain works and to perform certain duties. And when he was on the cross, he could say, it's done, it's finished, it is accomplished. When my grandmother here lay in her casket, if she could have spoken to us, she could say, hey, I finished my course. Much like Paul, I ran my race to the finish. I now go to receive my crown, my reward. And no doubt, we can look at her life and her legacy and her testimony and have full faith and assurance that when she entered through heaven's gates, it was with that abundant entry that Peter spoke of, and it was to the words of her Savior, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Well done. Well done. You see, we must work while it's day. The body will give out. We don't live on this earth forever. When we get to the end of our life, we will have done the works, or we will have failed in our service to the King. It's everybody's choice. Anybody who sits in the pew of a Christian church must answer to that, and we will. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of all we have ever done whether it was good or whether it was bad. That's what awaits us. Wanda entered into that abundant entry, and she beckons us from the gates, imitate me as I imitated Christ. Follow my example as I followed the example of Christ. We must work while it is day because the night comes when no one can work. My grandmother's work on this earth came to an end. She could no longer do any more works by faith. She can no longer live by faith, pray by faith, believe in faith. She can no longer worship and praise in faith. She can no longer gather with the saints in faith. Everything she does now is in the presence of the Father. She gives praise and worship to the very face of Jesus Christ. She worships with the angels all around her. Her life of faith has come to an end. And there comes that day when it's all finished and no man can work. We have this life. Grandma would teach us. We have this life to live and endure by faith, to pray by faith, to come to church by faith, to worship and praise by faith, to read and believe His Word by faith. We have this time given to us to serve the Lord by faith. There comes that day for all of us when the night approaches when we can no longer work, and when our testimony is now complete. And will your testimony be as Wanda's, imitate me as I also imitated Christ. Now we go to our next Bible verse, which I'm forgetting, my mind is going completely blank. <laughs> oh. Go over to 1 Samuel 12, 24. Samuel 12, 24. Only serve the Lord, or excuse me, only fear the Lord, and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things He has done for you. Fear the Lord, serve Him.
consider the great things that he has done. Grandmother's life was a life that spoke of service, and it also spoke of surrender. Her life was one that spoke of a person who had, at 18 years old, come to a place where she saw the Lord high and lifted up, and she chose to fear Him. She chose to serve Him with all of her heart, because she considered the great things that He had done for her. When a person can genuinely come before the cross of Christ, can truly see Him high and lifted up, can truly see Him dying for their sins, that they might live for Him, it is to be something that causes us, that motivates us, that by the Holy Spirit's power pushes us to surrender unto the Lord. To surrender unto Him our whole life. To fear Him, to serve Him, because we consider the great things that He has done for us. Grandma was one who, in her testimony, I was reading it the other day, she has a 12-page testimony that she wrote out some years ago. She says, everybody needs to have a Romans 12 in their life. And of course, there is that passage that speaks of us as living sacrifices unto the Lord. This is our reasonable service. We are to give ourselves to Him because He gave Himself for us. And she testifies that everyone needs that moment in their life. Every Christian needs to have that time when beyond salvation, they come to that place of surrender. Surrender to the Lord who saved them. When this happened in Grandma's life, it caused her to fear the Lord. It motivated her to serve Him in truth all of the days of her life, and with all of her heart. Because she had considered the great things that God had done for her. And she could not help but surrender. She speaks of the misery that she endured as an older teenager, when she was living a life, as she called it, on the fence. Not really surrendered, you know, sort of, uh, keeping her feet in the world and yet going to church and trying to play the Christian game, but it, it wasn't everything to her yet. And she speaks about how the life of the man who would become her husband, the life of that other teenager in the church, Jerry Osborne, how his life convicted hers. Oh, how his life convicted me, she says. Because he was someone who served the Lord with passion and without reserve. He served him as if he could do nothing else but serve him. And that was something that brought her misery because she wasn't in that place. And she speaks about finally giving her life to the Lord and experiencing such a peace where she even describes, I felt like I was floating above the ground. And she says she, she wondered if she looked around, would, would people look at her and think she was crazy because she was floating. She truly felt like she had levitated above the ground and wondered if other people could see. That's how she felt. Maybe that's what was really happening. Who knows? But uh, she says, I wondered, would this peace be with me tomorrow? I surrendered my life to the Lord. I felt his peace instantaneously just cover me and sweep over me. But would it be there the next day? And it was. Would it be there tomorrow? And it still was there. Would it be with me next year? And she found that the Lord was ever faithful to her. Once she surrendered to Him, she found joy in serving Jesus. The things that Jerry Osborne was doing that she thought, well, I don't like to go to church on Wednesday, and I don't like to hand out tracts, and I don't like to go doing all that church stuff. Those things that seemed so unjoyful to her previously, suddenly she found joy in serving Jesus once she had allowed the world to fade away, and once she had beheld the face of her Savior anew, and once she had surrendered to the one who had bought her. And she experienced joy and peace that she would attest followed her all the days of her life. And she wanted others who knew her and who would hear her story to know that part of the story. 
If you want joy, if you want peace, serve the Lord. Fear Him. Serve Him. Consider the great things that He has done for you. So if Wanda's life speaks of anything, it speaks of service. It speaks of surrender. And I'll take you to one last verse as we close. A verse that we all well know. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, and I'll read verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Grandma's life speaks of service. It speaks of surrender. Grandma's life speaks of a person who put their complete and their, their full trust in the Lord. Grandma was one who trusted in the will of God in all that she did. She trusted in Him. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. Allow His understanding to be higher than your own. Trust Him rather than yourself. So often, if, if for anybody who knew Grandma for very long, how often we, were, we would hear her say, well, if the Lord wills. Well, if it's the Lord's will, only. Well, if the Lord should provide. Well, if the Lord should tarry. If the Lord wills, if it's the Lord's will, then it shall be done. She was somebody who truly could rest in the will of God. She rested in Him. She rested in God, in His Son, and in His will. She is someone who would testify, even as she did on her deathbed. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will. He absolutely, positively will direct your path. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Follow my example as I also have followed the example of Christ. She trusted Him, and she exhorted others to put their trust in Him as well. Her life spoke of service and surrender and security. Security. That's something that is lost in this world today. <laughs> You know, I think my generation, although maybe it's only in, in a small part, is really the first since my grandmother's to sense a world of so much unrest. My father's generation, all the hippies, they, <laughs> you know, they protested and had the luxury of protesting because their parents had provided, for the most part, I know my dad grew up in poverty, but uh, for the most part, the hippies were hippies going to college, you know, parents sending them to school, and they're really protesting on their parents' dime. And that's why Ronald Reagan says, we won't let these brats do it on our dime, and he took away all of our uh, free college education in our state. No more hippies protesting at the schools. So, my generation, though, understands you may not be able to find another job. You may lose your job and not be able to find a new one. You, you don't have the assurance that there will be another paycheck or that the finances will be there. My grandma grew up during the Depression. I know this isn't the Depression, but we have suffered quite a recession, and over the last 20 years, we have seen our country really turn on its heels, really, and become a different place, become a different environment, an environment that doesn't feel as safe and secure as it once did. We wonder, where's the next person going to get their head cut off? Will it be L.A.? No, it will be Oklahoma? Does that make any sense to anybody? I don't know if you recall, a few weeks ago on the news, there was that man who cut somebody's head off in Oklahoma. You know, and uh, the police shootings, the protestings, the unrest. Now, my father's generation did know something of unrest. But I think when you connect the unrest with the economics of our generation, 
I, I think it creates an even greater monster. And Grandma would say, I found security in the Lord. I, I wasn't trusting, as my father and your pastor so often said, I'm not trusting in the hospital to keep my job or to give me a job or to pay my check. I'm trusting in the Lord. Right now, He's using you as the hospital to give me a job and to pay the check. But my trust isn't the Lord. My trust isn't in whoever's running the hospital. And that's such a lesson that we need to hear, that we need to understand. That we're trusting in the Lord. And I think Christians from other countries would testify to us. Some of Grandma's friends who uh, were missionaries in India and Africa. The Lord is still God. And He will still be your good shepherd even when you don't have the job. Even when you don't have whatever it is you're looking for that you think you need. When, when you feel that this world is not meeting your needs, the Lord will still be your shepherd. See, Americans think, oh, I'm going to give up on God if I can't find a job or if I can't uh, uh, buy a 40-inch flat screen or something like that. Then you go to Christians in India, uh, the ones that we support, uh, the ones that go to that Bible college that we support, and when they go into North India, where there's a lot of persecution against them, uh, I remember last year, they, there were some college students they couldn't account for. They went missing. They don't know what had happened to them. It's common for them to get murdered up there because their message is greeted with hostility. Well, is the Lord still with them when bad things happen? Is, was the Lord still with the martyrs when they gave their lives for the Lord? See, our American Christianity is a perverted Christianity. We believe in God when the bills are paid or when the money's coming in. We, we, see, we, we tend to relate to God through money, through prosperity in the United States. And yet, perhaps I can close in, in the book of Hebrews real quick. Um, this is how the Lord uh, sees His people and His faithfulness to them. Hebrews chapter 11 speaks about faith in so many different ways, but I want to summarize it briefly. Notice in verse 30. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women even received their dead, raised to life again. Now that's the gospel we want to preach and believe in. But what about the other part? Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Were tempted. Were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. Now, all of these, those who saw the walls fall down, saw the lion's mouth quench, saw the fire not hurt them, and those who were tortured and killed and murdered, who were impoverished, all of these had a good testimony of faith. All of them. Now sometimes our faith requires us to be that person who goes through the trial. Now others, hey, others see that the victory and the walls fall down and the receiving sight to the blind and people raising from the dead and just the glorious things, the things that we want to happen when we exercise faith. But we forget, just as valuable and perhaps more so in their testimony, are those who give their lives even to the end. It is said of Jesus that he loved his own even to the end. And Grandma would say, look, if you want to live your life like that, you need to find security. You need to learn how to trust the Lord. You need to learn how not to lean on your own understanding, but to acknowledge him in all of your ways and to trust what he's doing. And he will direct your path. Her life speaks of service. Her life speaks of surrender. And her life speaks of security. We can imitate her just as she imitated Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you for the wonderful saints that you bring about. Lord, 
those people who are faithful to give us a wonderful example that we might follow after you and that we might understand what it means to truly follow you. That we might understand what it means to be those who serve you, who are surrendered to you, and are secure in your love. Father, might we learn from your word and from the testimony of your godly examples in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul.